Hello, everyone. I'm Ann Leonard. I'm the Manton Curator of Prince Drawings and Photographs at the Clark. And I'm very glad to be welcoming you today to our um, program that it marks the end of our special exhibition, Durer and After. So if you haven't been to the show yet, um, you have just a few more hours. I was down in the galleries earlier and there, there are people about. So it's been a wonderful occasion to celebrate one of our belo most beloved artists, Albert Durer. Um, 2021 is a year of anniversaries for Durer. 550th anniversary of his birth. It also happens to be the 500th anniversary of his visit to the Netherlands at the end of his life. And it's also the occasion for 2021, that is for a book that has come out and became a runaway sensation called Albert and the Whale. Here's my copy. It was a wonderful part of my summer reading. And uh, we're privileged today and very happy to have at least virtually the author here, Philip Hoare. Philip is joining us from Southampton, England, where he lives. And we're disappointed not to have him here in person, of course. Uh, he knows our part of the world very well, and we are looking forward to welcoming him on a future real visit here. Uh, we will welcome him properly in person. But um, we do have his book in our shop, for those of you who are in Williamstown, and we're very excited to hear from him today about um, the writing of the book, Albert and the Whale, and some of the contents of it. Uh, one of the things that I like in the book is uh, that he reproduced the Clark's glorious drawing uh, called Sketches of Landscapes and Animals. And um, as you will define from the title, the whale is one of the very um, preferred animals that he, we will hear about today. Uh, let me give a brief introduction to Philip's uh, background. He is author and professor of creative writing at the University of Southampton. He has written books called uh, Leviathan or the Whale, which was the winner of the 2009 BBC Samuel Johnson Prize. Uh, also Serious Pleasures, The Life of Stephen Tennant, Noel Coward, A Biography, and England's Lost Eden, Adventures in a Victorian Utopia. Philip is also co-curator, pardon me, of the Moby Dick and Ancient Mariner, Mariner Big Reads among other whale related projects, which I think he may tell us about. And then finally, just a quick reminder for those of you who um, are new to Zoom or would like to pose questions after, uh, there is a Q&A function in the bottom of your screen, which you can use to type in questions, which we will take afterwards. Uh, for those joining you on Facebook Live, you can also put your uh, questions in the comments section and they will come through to us as well. So with that, let me thank Philip again for joining us and turn it over to him. Thanks so much, Anne. Well, welcome everyone and good afternoon. It's evening here in Southampton in the UK on the south coast of, of England. It's a grisly fall day and uh, uh, I'm really wishing I was in New England, which I do love, as Anne just said. And um, so, uh, so I'll be talking tonight about my book, Albert and the Whale, which was born in Massachusetts. Um, it came about when I was um, in Boston one February. I was doing a book tour. It was a snowy, cold day and I uh, had to get in out of the cold and uh, I wandered into the the Museum of Fine Art, and uh, there was a show of Jira's prints, um, the woodcuts, and a couple of the engravings. And I was astonished um, at being really brought face to face with these images, which were quite familiar images to anyone who loves art, who's interested in art. I mean, they're sort of images which they, they're, they're there, they're sort of part of the currency, really. But standing in a in the gallery on my own that, that afternoon, I just thought, this is incredible. I mean, these images might've just been run off the office photocopier. They're just so immediate, so stark, so modern. Um, the black and whiteness of them really, really struck me. And, uh, and it really struck me how Dura especially represented animals, uh, as Anne intimated. Um, uh, that really is partly what grabs me about Jura. Um, so yes, yeah, so I've just got some images which we can talk about, hopefully. Let me uh, grab control of those. And uh, yeah, so 
Excellent. So this man, Albert Dürer, he straddles two eras. He's rather like a Janus figure, a two-headed god, looking backwards to the medieval period and forwards to the modern period. He was born in 1471, died in 1528, which means he hits, he hits his acme, his peak, and at the age of 28, and 28 was considered, considered the peak of one's working life at that period, right at the year 1500. So he's at that break point. Um, and to me, he's, he's almost too impossible to see as someone who comes from a medieval world. Um, the way he looks at the world through his eyes is so intensely scientific. He's melding art with science. And of course, science is the new, the new way people are seeing the world at this moment. And what Dewar does is he takes the technology of his time, the developing technology, and of course, the greatest technology of his time is the printing press. And he takes that and he turns it to his art, literally. So he's born in Nuremberg, which was a, a technological center. It was the Silicon Valley of its time. There are a hundred printing presses in the city. Um, it was on a, a midway point, rather like Jura between time, it was in the midway point in geography and space because it had goods coming in from the East, from China, from India, goods and animals and ideas. And at the same time, it was receiving things from the West. Um, notably, Columbus's first reports of the new world were published in print in Nuremberg. Um, so you have, it's really rather like, center of the world in one way, um, certainly the Western world, Nuremberg. And Jura, born in Nuremberg, it grows up as, a, as an apprentice in his father's studio. His father's an engraver uh, and jeweler and, and, and goldsmith, but decides he wants to study fine art and does that with a, 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 an artist in Nuremberg. Um, and all sort of from that point of view, it seems kind of, you know, sort of par for the course for a, an early Renaissance artist. But what Jura does, almost shockingly, is that he absolutely harnesses the idea of the printed image and turns that into his own benefit as, uh, so I'm just, so, his first great impact on the, the imagination and on the um, artistic market of his time is literally stupendous. It's the series of engravings of the apocalypse, which he publishes himself through his own studio um, in 1498, just in advance of the possible apocalypse itself. Remember, we're talking, we're coming up to the year 1500. It's a period of pe which people do envisage some great you know, second coming, possibly, of Christ. Um, people are actually building towers uh, to avoid the coming deluge, which, which is expected. Um, what Dura does is he takes up that popular sentiment, the uh, apprehension, and he realizes it in woodcuts. But to call these images mere woodcuts is to really not do them a justice. It, uh, Dura has a almost alchemical power to create images. It's, it's again so modern that these images look like computer generated images to us, um, or like CGI, or perhaps an anime cartoon, uh, uh, an animation to them. Um, Erasmus says, Dura does in black and white what other artists can only do in color. And there's a sense of stripping these images down to the starkest, barest black and white essential, gives them volume and space and color itself. You almost see color in these images when you look at them. And what do they depict? They depict terrors. You know, the central image here, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, riding roughshod over, over, over the world, bringing famine and disease and death. Um, to the, to the left, this strange disembodied image from, from, from heaven, 
with St. John eating his own book. It's a completely bizarre image, which might come out of a, a fin de siècle image in, in Western Europe, you know, Orby Beardsley or Gustav Marot. Um, and then on the other side, actual angels up there in the sky, three-dimensional angels doing battle with dragons and demons. I mean, this is like a cinema trailer for, 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 the, for the apocalypse. Um, and and Jura, Jura's great impact is such that these images are disseminated throughout Western Europe. You know, he has franchises who are selling these images in, in various other countries. You can buy them from England to Norway to Italy. It's that way that he actually achieves his extraordinary reach. He becomes really the first international artist in many ways. And um, sometimes people will paste them up on the wall, like modern day posters, um, color them in. Um, rather like we have coloring in books now. Um, uh, and it's really that way that, to me, he's kind of almost like an Andy Warhol. He's producing like these screen prints. And it's almost, a, and of course, these images are often not even cut by himself. He draws them, but the design is made by the, the woodcutter, the person who's cutting the blocks. So there's a sense of the mechanical process, which seems very modern to us now. Um, and you know, He's, he's incredibly ambitious, Dürer. He's always looking for the next way to advance his art in quite a sort of German way and in a technical way, in a way, um, but also with this fine sense of the aesthetic. And how do you advance from this, from this technical innovation? Well, he does it by going one technological stage further and creating engravings. Now, for anyone who's lucky enough to see these images in real life, um, editions of these prints uh, from, from Dura's time, you'll know they are just astonishing. They're images into which you almost can dive. Um, for instance, the image on, the, on your uh, right hand, the night, the death and the devil, um, the layers of perception in that image are such that when I first saw it in the flesh, as it were, I was, it was almost like I was watching Narnia come to life or Lord of the Rings, you know, a kind of a science fiction fantasy film, because you can peer so far into that image and see the tower in the very background. And you can only see this in real life. Don't hope to see it in a print or a reproduction. You have to see the, the edition in its real, the, the, the print in its real life form. And you will see around that tower is a murmuration of starlings, a flock of starlings circling the tower it's it's unbelievable a modern artist working at RISD Rhode Island School of Design uh, Andrew Rafferty has tried for 20 years to reproduce square inches just a square inch of a Jura engraving he finds it impossible he he really can't work out how he did it um it's there's something quite magical about these images and these three images, the master image, master engravings that Jura produced, um, make this great claim for the state of the artist, the modern artist. And we see three states of being or thinking or feeling or emotion here. On the left, we have Saint Jerome in his study. This is based on Jura's study in Nuremberg. I've, I, I went to this um, Jura's house in Nuremberg and it's, it's very similar. The bottle glass windows and the, the thick walls, um, the very cozy atmosphere. And Jerome's there with his books, um, his lion at his feet. Of course, famously, he took the paw, took the thorn out of the paw of the lion and thereafter that lion was eternally loyal to Jerome. And of course, always with the Jura image, there's almost always a dog. Uh, if there's animals involved, there's a dog. And there's a little dog asleep there on the left uh, by the steps. It's a cozy, homely image. Contrast that with the image on the other side, the night, the death and the devil. And it's a fetid, stinking, image of death and devil, these worm-eaten, decaying figures trying to weigh the lay the, the, the noble knight, the literal freelancer. He's a freelancer, and that's where the expression comes from. And he has a, he has a fox's tail tied to his lance as a, 
uh, an emblem of his courage. And there's a sprig of oak leaves tied to your horse's tail is a similar uh, signal of, of intent. And running along underneath the horse's footprints is the loyal hound, snout straight ahead, just going ahead. We're not going to be waylaid by these evil um, temptations. Um, it's a remarkable image and it has a, a, a great history ahead of it. Some of it good and some of it not so good. Um, we might get to that later. But uh, And then we come into the middle image, which is perhaps the most cryptic image in all of Western art, M Melancholia 1. It starts being cryptic from its title onwards. You know, Melancholia 1, so does that mean there's a series of these uh, engravings? The title is held by this strange bat-like figure, which is kind of a spermy tail and a moon burst behind it. Um, a, a moon bow, I mean, rather, rather than a rainbow uh, and a comet. It's nighttime. It's a sort of spectral um, light, uh, a, a sharp, almost chiaroscuro. It's almost like um, uh, a von Sternberg film. You can imagine the angel as Marlena Dietrich, perhaps. Um, but that angel is ungendered, it seems to me. It, it hovers between, between states. Um, and this array of images, array of objects lying around the angel, um, their meaning is still remote to us. They may be Masonic, they may be alchemical, they are those things, but they are some, there's something else going on here. You know, the ladder leading up to nowhere, the dodecahedron with strange faces on it, um, the, the, the hourglass, the magic square with its numbers on it, the bell, um, the scales are emblems here. And most interestingly to me, uh, uh, myself, is that I saw the print, which is the print which was owned by John Ruskin. And so it was a pristine, um, uh, a pull of the print. And I could see that the angel's face, which hitherto I think has been described to me anyway in, 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 a, in, in, in critical accounts as, as scowling or, 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 or anxious, is actually smiling. There's a, there's a smile on, on the angel's face. And I think this underlies the notion of Melancholia One as a celebration of the artistic state of melancholy, of contemplation as a positive state. Um, that's key to what Joe is doing with himself as an artist. He's creating an identity for himself. And we see that really clearly in the next images, um, which are the three famous oil self-portraits of Jura, uh, painted from 1494, 1498 and 1500. And so we start uh, with him as a young man on the left there with what looks like a jellyfish on his head. Uh, he's very extravagantly dressed. Um, he's a bit grungy. Um, those could be earbuds tangled up in his red locks. Um, he's, he's not, he can't quite shave yet. He's sort of growing a red beard. Um, he looks a bit pallid a bit grungy, um, a bit disgruntled in the way teenagers are. It looks as though he's been asked to tidy up his bedroom. Um, he's wearing extravagant clothes, that kind of off the shoulder shirt. And uh, he's very proudly, uh, almost, almost vainly dressed in a way. But then there's this cryptic sea holly, the eryngium plant that he's holding in his hands and the strange kink in his fingers and the way the stem of the sea holly seems to pierce the other hand. Is that an emblem of Christ's crucifixion? Or are there other elements in that, um, perhaps as a gift to a lover? We know that he gets married soon after this, but it's an arranged marriage. And then the second image, which is a painting made when he came back from his first visit to Venice. Suddenly, he's a sophisticate. He's dressed in black and white. He might be dressed by Versace or Prada. Um, he is elegant. He has learned to fence. He has learned to dance. He has learned the magical secret of perspective. And he's showing this by the fact that it looks as though he's traveling in a train going across the Orient Express across the Alps with the Alps in the background. Of course, by showing the Alps in the, Alps in the background, he's showing he's a traveler. He's international. He's cosmopolitan. Um, Cryptically, notice there's a chunk being cut out of his hair, out of his oiled and ringed hair. Uh, it's a great ringlets of 
that was sure his they, his friends used to joke that his servant spent hours getting his hair ready in the in the morning for for his master. It's very obviously been cut away. Is that a lock for a lover? Or is there another significance to that? I don't know, but it's definitely purposely there. And then you come to the last image, which is almost the most outrageous of all, because he's painted himself as Christ. His monogram, the AD, so the D in the A, it's no coincidence, it's Abbot Dura, Anno Domini. Um, he is looking straight ahead at us. The eyes of that image are incredibly disconcerting. I went to see original portrait in the Alps Pinakothek in, in Munich, and it, you couldn't turn your back on that image. It was disconcerting. Uh, and it has many cryptic um, elements to it. Why is he holding his fingers like that? What does that signify? Um, why is a patch of the Martin, and it's a very lavish fur coat he's, coat he's wearing with this fur mantle, this fur collar. Part of it has been cut away again. It's been almost shaved. It's strange, blackened part of it. Um, the, he's actually changed the way he's looked. He's elongated his face to look more Christ-like. Uh, more like the traditional um, uh, uh, iconic, I iconic image, and the true use of the word iconic image of Christ. Um, he has manipulated himself, again, in a very modern way to resemble an imitation of Christ. And again, the, Im the, Im the, 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 the focus on in all three of these images, as much as it is on the eyes, the seeing eyes of the artist, are the doing hands of the artist. Look at that, each, each of those portraits, the hands, the focus goes to the hands. And he's showing that they are not the hands of an artisan, they are hands of an artist, an individual, a psychologically individual creator of art, not someone who's just being commissioned to do stuff, but someone who is creating images. And he's creating images, these images he can't sell, they are, in one way, they are, they, are, they are showpieces for his art. It's showing how wonderful a portrait painter he is. But also, they, or, uh, they, there's something quite existential about them. You know, it's not far away from uh, Hamlet, you know, the self-questioning young man, um, a kind of uh, existential status about that, in a way. Um, so, yeah, so this is Jura, the man. Um, and then Dura, the artist, to me, achieves his real absolute pinnacle for me in a way in, with images which might have been almost incidental to his career. Other people would not have considered these images in the way we consider them now, because again, they are so modern. Um, I was very lucky, I, uh, uh, I, I was writing my book before the lockdowns and everything, so I got to travel through Europe and see these images, see the actual works of art themselves. And these, uh, these two uh, very fragile watercolors, uh, which are held in the Abertina in, in, in Vienna. Um, some of you have may have been there. And um, these, these two images are only shown once every 10 years because they're so fragile, so light sensitive. Um, and I was lucky enough to be taken into the storerooms, this nuclear bunker underneath the museum. Uh, and these gray boxes were brought out and I could almost hear the hair scrabbling her paws to get out of the box as it was opened up and she was brought out like a conjurer's trick. And it is a trick. I mean, it's a trick. I mean, uh, that hair is life size. She's painted with a single hairbrush, the lines on the last sort of finishing touches that the fur of her of her coat. Um, you feel as though you want to pick her up and stroke her, 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 her ears, or maybe explain the history of art to her, as Joseph Boyce did. It's a direct reference to, um, uh, to Dura. Um, she's sitting, the, the perspective from which we see that hair is remarkable. It's like we're seeing her from a little bit above. Um, she's probably sitting on his kitchen floor. In fact, the curator of the Abertina joked but he wasn't joking he said actually probably the next moment she was in the cooking pot which <laughs> is not very modern uh, 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 concept but um, 
the hair, of course, has other uh, associations, religious with, with the Virgin Mary, um, pagan, being hermaphroditic. Um, it's a very, very powerful image, and it does stay with us because it does seem so modern. Place next to it, the large clump, the large turf. It's a still piece of summer. It's like a snapshot of summer. Uh, it's like he's taken a Polaroid of a clump of earth outside his the castle walls of Nuremberg. Um, they're just dandelions. They're weeds. Uh, no one painted dirt before Jura. But they almost wouldn't dare to. It's almost blasphemous. It's almost his, it's God's eye, that God's hand that creates these, not the artist's hand, the artist's eye. And you can, see, you can see the roots of the plants. And there's something about this image which is still time. It's like a microcosm of the macrocosmic world, the new world, which is being seen in you by scientists, by artists. Um, the dandelions will burst into those clocks, you know, the great fluffy balls and the, 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 the seeds will float into the sky. And it's, it's almost as though time has stopped, but time is going on. There's something incredibly moving about these images. Um, they, uh, they speak of Jura's intellect and his childlike enthusiasm, his naivety. All artists, all good artists are childlike, naive, looking, staring in wonder. And, and, and that's what Jura does to me. Um, he looks and sees in wonder. And so what can he do to follow that? He can, be, he can paint the beginning of time itself. This image is no bigger than a paperback book. It's in the National Gallery of, uh, in London. It's on the reverse of it is an image of St. Jerome in the desert, again with his lion, beating his chest with a rock. And he's in the desert, beating his chest with a rock. And the place in which his chest, the rock hits his chest, directly corresponds as you turn the picture around to the center of this comet, and it is a comet. It's, it's, it's a comet, but it's more than comet, it's mega comet. It's, it's exploding, it's a kind of fireball. It's, 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 a, it's a metaphysical image. It could have been made by William Blake. Um, it's one of my favorite images of jurors because it's so huge, but it's reduced to something just so small, only you know, smaller than an iPad. And, to me, it just speaks of his, his, his wonderful vision and the darkness of his vision. He was often having visions um, and his, 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 his perception of the world sometimes seems a little bit almost drug-like in a way. Um, there's something that in the way that he perceives things and at a time of changing faith, you know, he's working at the time of Martin Luther. Martin Luther says that the uh, the the printing printing images printing text is going to be disastrous for humanity. You're unleashing all this information on people. Um, remember, at this point, you would see if you're an ordinary person, an ordinary non-royal, non-merchant prince person, you would see very few human-made images in your lifetime. Probably mostly in a church. Um, Nowadays, we see as many images as they saw in their entire lifetime in 30 seconds on the internet. Um, so the power of these images being reproduced is really, really striking. It is as important as the internet has been to us. Um, printing revolutionizes the world. Um, and Jura is uh, an explicit exponent of that power. He knows how to use it. Um, and he uses it in remarkable ways because he uses it to make images of things that he hasn't seen. Now, he claimed to have seen or he may have indeed seen this, this, this meteorite falling to Earth, but he definitely didn't see this next thing. Oh, sorry, gone too bad, which is a rhinoceros. Now, this is one of Dura's most famous and most successful woodcuts. It went to eight editions. Um, it's literally immortal because they were still printing from the woodblock, wood the same block, 
after Dürer died. So it's almost as his art was living on after him. Now, this rhinoceros was the rhinoceros we knew in Western Europe for about 400 years until the invention of natural history documentaries, basically in zoos, I suppose. But the amazing thing is, is that Dürer never saw this animal at all. It was a Indian elephant um, rhinoceros sent to King Manuel I of Portugal. It arrived in Lisbon in May, 1515. And Dürer was receiving reports of this extraordinary animal arriving on European shores, one of the first times it had been seen, certainly since classical times. Um, he was receiving reports from German agents. Now they were commercial agents, but there's also a sense of espionage as well. They're sending back descriptions of this animal and very sketchy images, so really just, just sketchy, um, not, 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 not at all detailed. It's, it's a measure of Dura's power that he creates this image of this animal, which is more rhinoceros than a rhinoceros. It's squeezed into the frame of this image, so the tusk is pulled right up to one side of the frame, the, 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 the butt of the animal is right at the other end. It's, it's, it shows how, how huge this animal is. That's a very clever trick. Um, and it transcends an animal. It, it's more like a map, a relief map, a, or, or, or a star map, or um, it's cratered, it's plated. It's a bit like an armored tank, this creature, but it's hairy and scaly and fissured. And to top it all, as if it wasn't enough, Jura sticks an extra tusk, an extra horn for good luck in the back of the animal. And that tusk is the tusk of a narwhal, a sea unicorn, widely believed and widely marketed throughout Europe as the true horn of a unicorn, uh, able to cure, uh, to cure uh, uh, people from, from poisoning, uh, had all sorts of uh, alchemical and magical powers. Um, Dura is mashing stuff up to create something which expresses the rhinocerousness of being rhino a rhinoceros. And um, it really points a lot to me to his interest in the sea as well. He's very interested in the sea, um, most especially because in 1520, he, he, he left Nuremberg um, for the Low Countries to go to Antwerp, um, ostensibly to get a new a new pension from uh, the Holy Roman Emperor that Maximilian I, his former um, uh, patron, had died and his successor, Charles V, his nephew, was going to be crowned in Aachen. And uh, uh, the story is that Dürer was leaving Nuremberg to go and uh, lobby for his pension. Well, that's partly true, but what's also true is that Nuremberg was under an emergency civic administration because a virulent wave of the plague had hit the city and everyone who could afford to was fleeing. So all of Jura's patrons, these wealthy princes and merchants were, it's almost they were jumping in their helicopters and flying off to the healthy sea air of, of Antwerp. Um, and it's while he's there that he hears about a whale stranded on the coast of Zeeland, this marshy, strange, neither land nor sea area on the edge of the low countries of the Netherlands. Um, and he charters a boat with some of his drinking and gambling friends. Jura is a great drinker and gambler. Uh, and they sail towards the spot where this whale has been stranded. And they told it's a mile long and its stink is about to poison the entire local village. Um, but this great storm strikes up and, and, and the ship on which, on which Jura is traveling is smashed onto the quayside at Middleburg. Some of the passengers get off, but the ship is then blown out again by an offshore wind. And it seems as though Dura is about to drown. The greatest, by now, his reputation is such that he is the greatest artist of the Northern Renaissance. And um, we are about to lose him. Um, but in a sort of scene from Shakespeare's Tempest, he, he, he gets control of the, the ship and, and, and says, pull in these sheets and whatever, and they get back to shore. Um, but of course, in the same storm, the whale has been washed off. Um, offshore. Uh, and that has implications for Jura in many ways, not only uh, on his health, um, but also on the notion of what an artist can dare to achieve. Could a, can an artist dare to depict the greatest animal on earth? And indeed, would we have thought differently about the whale if we'd had 
a dura print of a whale, a very accurate dura print of a whale to look at. Um, Herman Melville in Moby Dick says, um, nobody, and he's writing the year 1850, 1851, nobody has ever drawn an accurate image of a whale to date. Uh, uh, he would, he would, that would have changed if he'd, if he'd seen Dura's image. And of course, Melville was a great aficionado of art and was a great lover of Dura's work. He refers to him as that Dutch savage in Moby Dick um, and compares Dura's works to Scrimshaw, which is quite an interesting comparison. Um, and also interesting, I suppose, uh, in relation to this uh, next image, which in lieu of being able to uh, draw a, a, a whale, draw, draw this incredible image of um, a walrus, um, which is a sepia um, and, uh, and body color image. It's in the British Library and Special Collections there. It's not, again, because it's a very fugitive image, um, it's not often put on show. Um, and it's a very strange thing. It's a very strange object. Um, where, do you see, where did Jura see this? It's quite coincidental, actually, that um, he, he, his caption says he saw it on the Netherland, in the Netherlandish Sea. This animal was captured in the Netherlandish Sea. Well, and he saw it on his journey there uh, in 1520, 1521. Uh, <laughs> this very week on that same shore, a female walrus has turned up. <laughs> and I really thought, uh, it's, like, it's like Melville, what, what has my, my art summoned up this strange beast? And, um, and uh, but there are many uh, aspects of this image of, uh, of a walrus which are deceptive too. Uh, it's possible that Jura only ever saw a decapitated head of a walrus, and not the whole image animal itself. Um, but there's something magnetic about the way he produces these images that speaks to his 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 his. Uh, he has the he has the sensibility of someone creating a cabinet of curiosities, a Wunderkammer. Uh, which the, the, the fashion for this is just about to start up and Dura on his travels in the Netherlands is collecting sharks, fins, live monkeys and parrots and all sorts of bizarre curiosities um, which fuel his imagination in the same way that Rembrandt would have the same sort of things in his house in Amsterdam, whale bones and strange things such as that um, to spark his imagination. There is this real interest in the, in the natural world and it comes from a sense of trying to understand, not to invent fables or myths. Um, Jura, Jura is always very keen to dispel those things. Um, and so um, for me, uh, because of my, I have a great interest in, in Wales, particularly having written about them and about Melville, um, I, I would love to have seen what he did with that whale. And the strange thing is, that we can sort of see what he would have done with that whale because such was the power of his art that he really influenced a lot of um, artists um, in, in Northern Europe, especially, and especially in, um, in, in the Netherlands. Um, and one particular artist, Jan Rand Sanredam, who actually was creating copies of, of Jura's engravings of Melancholia, made this image. which to my mind is probably how Dura would have drawn the whale. Um, it's almost like melancholia done from the point of view of a whale and, uh, and it's freighted with omens and symbols. Um, uh, but they are images, it's, it's a very accurate image of a whale. Um, and it really is, to my mind, what Dura might have done, and it's paint, it's created at the end of the century, which saw Dura die in, in, in 1528, but it really refers to Dura's um, eye in a way. Um, and to me, it's it's another reflection of what Dura says about the way we've treated the world in a way. The um, uh, uh, Dura's uh, span his time on earth really coincided with the beginning of the Anthropocene, the point at which we started to affect the, 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 the ecological balance of the planet. Um, the exploitation um, that began around this time, both of um, animal resources, of human resources, um, in, in, uh, enslavement, 
all these things that, that were in the future and in which many ways um, uh, Dura, Dura's life was, was, was a reflection of them in some ways. Um, and, it, and it's counterpointed too with the way we see the natural world now, you know, the, the threats, you know, where you see those grass, the, the, the large turf or the hair, they do seem incredibly fragile. They are physically fragile, but they seem to be metaphysically fragile as well, um, because we know um, that those things are under threat. And, um, and Dura's uh, mission to see the whale had a, had a sad outcome because from the point, that point onwards, he felt a fever in him. And it may well be that he caught malaria in the swamps of Zeeland. He might have caught a zoonotic disease from the whale as well, but I think it might have been malaria. Uh, there are other there are other theories that he actually possibly caught syphilis there, oh, or certainly possibly in Antwerp. Whatever the fact was that actually Jura would die in 1528, still suffering this feverish condition, which was a long-lasting one, and does indicate malaria in a way, which is known as the intermittent malady and can come and go. Um, and so there's no way in which maybe Dura's um, Mephistophelian contract uh, had expired. Um, uh, and there are many ways in which in the book, I try to extend the story of Dura's influence into the 20th century through figures such as Thomas Mann, who addressed the way that Dura's images were being used by the Nazi uh, government um, uh, uh, to pro propagate their own uh, horrific ideas. Um, Thomas Mann's book, uh, Dr. Faustus, uses Dura as, a, as an image um, uh, which he modernizes to a kind of um, avant-garde composer, sort of a Schoenberg figure, um, who actually turns into Dura himself in that book. Uh, and that, for me, also swivels around and is uh, used by uh, the great poet Marianne Moore in Greenwich Village, who goes to the Met in uh, 1928, which is the 400th anniversary of Jura's death. And she sees, rather than the way I saw the exhibition in Belston, um, and she sees Jura's woodcuts for the first time and, um, uh, 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 and images of his portraits. And she, she's in love. She almost physically feels drawn to this man. I don't mean sexually, I mean in a metaphysical, in an artistic, in a time traveling shape shifting way um, she talks about you know the way he he looks at things through backwards and forwards through time and in her wonderful poem um, uh, the steeplejack she imagines jurors stranded whales arriving in brooklyn and looking out from brooklyn and seeing these whales on the shore there um, uh, and there's many other ways in which Dura appears in, in modernist art from W.H. Auden um, through to various other artists. But uh, it's that sense of, 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 um, of uh, precognition, in a way, of the auguries that, that Dura throws up. And, and of course, our, our uh, images of the natural world now um, are problematic. Um, this is an image from um, the Netherlandish shore of a stranded sperm whale. Um, uh, and this was taken recently by a friend of mine, Jeroen Hergendijk. Um, it really seemed to me a startlingly Jura-esque image. Again, it's kind of the whale he would have portrayed. Uh, he would have added a rainbow in the background. He would have had this kind of almost proto turnerian sky. There's something of the Turner around this. And of course, Turner was a great aficionado of Jura, as was William Blake, as was William Morris, as was Aubrey Beardsley. Um, uh, the, the, the power of Jura continues. Um, and this image, which is poignant because it shows the, the death of a whale, also speaks to some other kind of astrological ideas in a way, because Jura did feel himself to have lived under the influence of, of, of the stars. Um, and 
interestingly, the sperm whale strandings, this is a sperm whale, sperm whale strandings in the North Sea on the Netherlandish and German and, and sometimes the English coast have been linked to solar storms, which mess with the animal's G natural GPS, their na navigational systems, which rely on um, uh, electromagnetic currents in the Earth's crust, are, are messed with by solar storms. So it's almost as though maybe the stars do foretell our fate. Um, and the same phenomena which produces the aurora borealis and aurora australis uh, has this effect on us too, uh, on, on Earth. So I just want to end my presentation with just going back to that portrait, which I was lucky enough to see in, in, in Munich. And um, what I hadn't realized, and again, you don't really see from, from unless you actually see the work of art itself, is, is that in the year 1900, so at the beginning of the, of, of the 20th century, the modern century, um, someone walked into the Alt Pinacotech and scratched out Jura's eyes. You can still, they haven't been able to totally restore them. And you can see the two scratches drawn through their eyes. Um, and it's almost like uh, in Shan Andalou, like the Bunuel film where an eye is slit open. This is almost someone has been so disturbed by what Dura sees through his eyes, the way he's looking backwards and forwards. Um, that seems to be quite disturbing as much as it is rewarding. Um, and I also think when I look at this piece of art, uh, I think of Jura saying when, when, when he asks himself the question, he asks himself, what is beauty? And all he can say is, I don't know. Thank you. That's lovely, Philip. It's very hard to... Um follow that <laughs> comments <laughs> except to say thank you um you you've um conjured up really so much of the experience of at least mine of of reading the book uh and the way that your reflections travel through time that they they teem with um detail and illusions and best of all really restore the wonder uh, of these images. Um, so thank you for that. Um, it's just so, so incredibly rich. Um, I'm, I'm just, and you've absolutely convinced us of the modernity of these works as well uh, in, in, your, in your way of drawing them out, of taking us inside and then drawing out from them so many connections uh, that seem so almost distressingly modern. Uh, so, so thank you again for that. I'm, I'm, I'm very struck by uh, you, you mentioned the um, sort of, I, I, I see there are a couple of questions coming in, so I'll get to those in just a moment. But for myself, selfishly, I, I want to ask you, of course, the first one, which, or, or maybe two, if you'll let me, um, which is some, one thing you mentioned was the practice Durer had of uh, making images of things that he couldn't see. And I wondered if in your experience, I assume, and in, in your experiences in writing a book about him, which I think I told you in a prior conversation, it wonderfully sort of scrambles the genres, right? The, the bookstore where I got my copy, didn't know whether it was an art book or a, or a fiction book or, you know, a biography, you know, <laughs> what it was. And it's a little bit of, of all of those, but um, I imagine that's somewhat liberating for you uh, as a creative author. It gives, it gives you permission really to, to interpret away and to invent and, and to imagine, mm -hmm. um, which must be a wonderful experience. It, well, exactly, you're exactly right, because, because it's, it's 500 years ago, it's very difficult to us, for anyone to turn and say, you're wrong about that in a way. So you can say, you could, well, Timothy Morton, the great eco-philosopher said, all artists from the future, so in a way, we're always looking back at art. We're trying to catch up with it in a way. That's what I felt about Jura. And I always felt that, especially because I was, I, I, I was lucky enough to, to be in the same space as these works. So when you are looking at that piece of work, it is, it is a piece of time travel because you're feeling a little bit of what the artist felt when they made that picture. So, and because the artist is, is in that picture in their 
imagination, but also they're physically there, their hair and their spit, <laughs> you know, they're, they're there. They're, uh, 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 and it's, um, when you're talking about oil paintings, anyhow, um, the, 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 I went to see some of the wood blocks that Dürer's um, prints were made from in the British Library. And that was, that really almost disconcerted me because the idea that Dürer would have handled those and these, these blocks, which are much used, they had this leaden sheen. They almost look like fossils, mm. mineral rather than wood. Um, and I could see how the, how excited he would have been there, standing there to see the first print coming off. You know, it's like waiting for your photographs to be developed, isn't it? And, uh, <laughs> and so to be, to be aware of the process, I suppose, to be aware of the process and the process in which we are, are complicit because art can only exist if it has someone to look at it, really. Um, it, 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 that's how it works, um, like theatre or anything. But um, so, yeah, and to be able to know, uh, because, because Jura was never not famous, he never had a dip in his career. He was always famous. So he's always there. You know, when William Blake got rid of all his possessions, he had to get rid of everything. The one thing he kept was the, his melancholia, which he kept above his, his rooms over the, over the Thames, you know. Um, so the, there's, there's this sense of him moving through time space. So for a writer, that's so freeing because you can go with him, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can join along. And he went to many interesting places. Mm. <laughs> um, and I guess that the only other thing I, I've sort of, that struck me about that, especially in relation to prints, which of course are the, the subject of, of the exhibition I curated, um, there's a sort of, um, I guess, counterweight maybe, or, or a, a sort of competing sense of that um, freedom and permission you were speaking of, which is also this incredible authority granted to the printed image. Right, so if Dura makes an image of a rhinoceros, which he's never seen, mm -hmm. that printed piece of paper, which may get printed hundreds, thousands of times, circulated, there's script around it, there's inscription, you know, there's sort of a publisher, there's all sorts of letters and, and supporting authority, that has a strange way of becoming the image of a rhinoceros for many people who see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was, when I was writing the book, I was in, uh, in Nantucket, and I got a bottle of wine from the local liquor store, and I turned around the and it was a Jura's rhinoceros, and it was so funny. Uh, um, but yeah, because it's that is an ex that that is the the, the extent of its power, but it is print as you say, it's printing that has allowed that to happen um, because it's amazing that this that image actually ends up in a Colombian villa at the end of the 16th century that it, that image is painted on the wall and because it's become it's trans it's even transcended the printed image because mm -hmm. it becomes its power goes in beyond its own physical self you know it's yes. that's what he's launched yes yes really remarkable wow. well well thank you again um i have a question here um it's a little cryptic but i'm just going to read it to you and it says about uh, spinoza's reaction to Dürer. Can you speak to that? Spinoza, I can't can't recall that. I might have to be reminded of that. I know, I know Erasmus's reaction. I've, I've forgotten Spinoza, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm not I'm not I'm not encyclopedic on the on the on the maybe yeah. our, our, our attendee can re remind us in a comment. Okay. Can... All right. Um so yeah and then you have um Phrase of thanks uh, from another listener and, and watcher who's saying this talk was absolutely wonderful. Uh, a question about whether this recorded whether this uh, recorded presentation will be available for future viewing, and the answer is absolutely yes. So we're we're glad to be able to, to offer this. Um, I don't see any more questions in the box. I encourage anyone listening who has questions for for Philip to pose them through either Q and A in Zoom or by or by comments through Facebook Live, that um, what I imagine would be happening is sort of what's happening in my mind, which was that it's overflowing with um, mm. ideas and thoughts yeah. and illusions yeah. and beautiful yeah. images uh, yeah. that you've brought to life, uh, mm. somewhat in the way that Erasmus said uh, Dura did with his own black and white images. Mm. So they're in full color, technicolor. Yeah. Um, and so I I just, um, yeah, want to, want to thank you again for this 
presentation. Excellent. It's my yeah. pleasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, wait, 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 one, one more coming through. I oh, this seems to be someone uh, from a, perhaps a fan who has, uh, who knows <laughs> a bit more of you and uh, your habits, asking if you still see swim daily. I do. I uh, swim today. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, it, I often swim in the dark, uh, three o'clock in the morning. Um, sometimes where, where I live, um, there's um, uh, zooplankton, uh, uh, zoo, zooplankton, which are bioluminescent in the water. So it's for starry night. You have stars in the sky and stars in the water. So, yeah, it's kind of wonderful. In fact, I learned that in Provincetown. I learned my my landlady in Provincetown is an artist called Pat DeGroote. And um, uh, she she really she turned me onto the sea in a way. Uh, she's a wonderful woman. And uh, um, she uh, she had this house which is built over the sea. So I actually. I could almost roll out of bed into the sea. Um, and uh, once you start getting to that kind of, you can't really go back in a way. It just becomes compulsive and you're, you're governed by the tides and so you're governed by the moon. So when it's a full moon, um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. So I, I do, I, I, yeah, I'm obsessive about it. <laughs> Thanks, Meg. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's only it's only uh, October in New England, so some of us may still be able to aspire to that habit um, yeah. or before winter sets in uh, completely. Yeah. But um, again, just want to say thank you so much. Thank all of our uh, viewers for joining for this really lovely event. I couldn't have wished thank for you. a more you know appropriate and sort of mind blowing uh, closing day event yeah. for the exhibition. So thank, thank you. you all, and uh, hope to see you soon around the Clark, and in that includes you, Philip. Hope to see yeah. you soon here when. Oh, you possible. will. Yeah. You will, God willing. Thank you. Great. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.